executive director of the Blue and Gray Education Society. And the other face you ought to see on your screen is our, uh, is our speaker, Greg Mertz. Um, we, uh, we're, we're just getting this started. And um, uh, as we worked our way through it, we put out the notification, as you're aware, on uh, Monday night and had 95 people sign up in 24 hours. We've got 30 people right now. And as we were trying to make the switch over from one to the other uh, to come to another meeting room, uh, the, the, uh, the connection dropped. And so the other people are probably wondering what's going on or where they're at and stuff, but I don't know any way that we can get back and bring them this way. So uh, we're gonna go ahead with that and, and beg the apologies of folks that are there. And as you can tell, this is a work in progress. We expect to get a lot better in subsequent weeks, but uh, this one, we did a dry run yesterday and, um, and then ran into a few uh, technical glitches uh, with Zoom uh, in the pre-presentation today, which necessitated us moving over and so forth. Um, what we are going to, uh, to do today is uh, you all are, are going to be able to observe what's going on um, uh, in an interview that I'm going to conduct with Greg, and he has got a PowerPoint that will go along, and um, uh, uh, he, he's got a PowerPoint that he's going to deliver um, uh, his remarks to those questions with. We're going to run this for about 40 minutes or so, and then you'll be able to type in questions uh, in the chat feature uh, of uh, the Zoom thing, and then I will moderate and look at those, and I may or may not ask, answer those questions. Now, what you all will need to know, you can ask a question while Greg is talking, and I will see that question come up. Greg won't see that. I'll make the determination as to whether or not to interject that question as part of the uh, string of, of um, what Greg is talking about at that time. I may or may not uh, take your question. When we get to about the ninth question of the 11 that I plan to ask Greg, uh, I'll let you know that if you have any questions to go ahead and, uh, and send them ahead, and then I will screen those things over the last couple and then arrive at an order to ask questions. I will then ask the question, uh, from whomever is asking it of Greg, and Greg will be able to go ahead and respond. We'll try to get through as much of that as we can. You won't, at this point, you won't have any um, interaction uh, directly with the speaker uh, because we can't let it stress away or stra uh, straddle away in that nature with this being our first event, and we appreciate your doing and being patient with us. What we are doing is within a day, we intend to post the entire interview uh, on our website and we will send you updated information and a link on that. Um, and I apologize, I'm, I'm getting all the notes from people now who are sending me notes saying they can't connect, what, what should I do? And I can't respond to them. I'll deal with that in a little bit, but um, uh, that's the mode of operation we're gonna go with. So. Um, Karen, do you have any administrative uh, announcements before we get started? I muted myself. Uh, there is, you can click on the chat at the bottom of your Zoom screen. And I've made the chat available to everybody. So you can type your questions and Len will be able to see those questions. Okay, yeah, and that's, that's true, and I will see him, and then I will will screen from there. Anything else you got there, Karen? Uh, no. If you if you send me a, a a chat or whatever with a person who's sending you a message, just simply paste, copy and paste the meeting room number and the and the passcode, and send it right back to him. Okay. Okay. I I think that's going to be a bit much, and also work with uh, with Greg. I just will. We'll go out. Some people are upset. I can see because I'm getting some some love notes uh, that keep popping on the screen. But um, we'll deal with that in due course. Okay. Well, let's go ahead and get started then. Um, uh, 
as I said, folks, I'm Len Rydell, and this series that we're offering you over the next five months, and then we intend to extend it beyond that point uh, uh, as we get better and better with this and we'll move into other things, is to help us transition back into getting back out into the field. And so what we are doing is we're going to offer a whole series of uh, lectures of basically one, one hour a week over the next five months. And we'll announce the next one, for example, uh, uh, Tim Smith is going to do uh, Grierson's Raid next Wednesday, and we'll announce that uh, tomorrow, uh, and we will move along that way. But the purpose behind this is just to give you all some sense as to the historian and their interest in the topic and the tour that they're going to be doing. Uh, we'll ask some probing questions about that, give you a chance to get to know them fairly well. We'll let you interdict some questions or, or put some questions forward that I can then ask them. And we'll finish up right at about an hour. While we do all this, it's all being recorded. And within a couple of hours after we finish this, we will then go ahead and um, uh, post it up and we will send you an email to let you know how to go and view that. So uh, with that, we'll give it a ride and uh, hopefully not run into any other uh, difficulties. So thanks again for being here. And uh, uh, Greg, delighted to have you with us. Um, uh, we go back a lot long ways, about some 25 years now. I remember us working together on one of the very first uh, Blue and Gray programs back in 1995 in the wilderness. Um, why don't, would you tell us a little bit about your career in the National Park Service and what inspired you to enter and, and make uh, the Park Service a career? Uh, well, Lynn, my, my interest in both parks and in the Civil War grew from my Boy Scout experiences, hiking, camping, or canoeing in county, state, or national parks and forests. Um, I did an internship with the uh, Missouri State Park System at Babbler State Park, just outside of St. Louis. And then after I graduated, as I did that while in college, and when I graduated, uh, since my ideal job was to try to work in a Civil War park, I knew I needed to get some temporary or seasonal experience with the National Park Service. And at that time, we're talking uh, 1980, um, one was limited to applying to only two different national parks. My thought was everybody that's interested in the Civil War will want to work at Gettysburg and I should probably avoid applying there. And so I applied to two parks that I thought were of the most kind of modest interest, if you will. And I never heard back from either of those parks. One of them happened to be Wilson's Creek. And since I lived in St. Louis, Missouri, I went down one weekend and I ran into Rick Hatcher, who I explained to him my strategy and asked if he could explain or you know give me some ideas why I hadn't heard from, from uh, Wilson's Creek. And uh, he said, well, the he understood my strategy, but uh, pointed out that I also applied to two very small parks with small staffs. And he indicated that at Wilson's Creek, they only had two people that did the job that I applied for, and they both came back from the previous year. So his advice to me was to apply to a bigger park that is likely to have some turnover because of the size of its staff. And he specifically recommended that I apply to Gettysburg, the one park that I figured I should avoid. So I took his advice, applied there next year, and I happened to apply the same winter that Mamie Eisenhower had died, which meant that the Gettysburg National Military Park and Eisenhower National Historic Site now had a need for a much larger staff, and they were hiring a lot of new people, and I ended up being the very last person they hired for the summer of uh, 1980. So that's my Everybody seems to have an interesting story of how they got in, and that is, uh, that is my story. I uh, was at Gettysburg and Eisenhower in either a temporary or permanent capacity for four years, and I had an opportunity to apply for an opening at Fredericksburg and Spotsylvania National Military Park. One of the interesting things in working at uh, Gettysburg is how often it came up uh, that if something odd or difficult was, uh, was coming up, they would say, gee, I wonder how Bob Crick, the chief historian down at Fredericksburg, handles that. 
So I had, uh, during my tenure at Gettysburg, I had heard about Fredericksburg being this great place to work. And I, of course, knew that uh, it had the most complex Civil War story of any national park. So I transferred here and have been promoted several times. Um, now um, I have 36 years in here at Fredericksburg. And one of the aspects of my work is supervising the volunteer program. So the slide that Karen selected as one of my volunteers out at Chancellorsville giving a tour. So uh, that's how I got into this. Well, now with, with all that time spent at Fredericksburg and Gettysburg, what in the world inspired your interest at Shiloh? Um, well, Karen, could I have the next slide? Um, and that relates back uh, again to my, my Boy Scout experiences. Um, I belonged to a troop which went down to the Shiloh battlefield every single spring. There was some local uh, scout leader down in the Shiloh area that laid out a series of six different trails. So part of the reason we went back every year is you did something different. The first year hit the, the main tour stops. The second year was specifically an artillery hike where you uh, learned about how cannon worked and learned how to identify the different pieces and why there are so many different pieces and such. And um, um, Shiloh is, is responsible for getting me interested in the Civil War as a whole, too. And I even have a specific moment related to this site. This is known as Ruggles's Battery, um, a place where during the battle, a man named Daniel Ruggles uh, lined up some 52 artillery pieces opposite the hornet's nest. And during one of my visits, a subsequent visit, obviously not a first one, we're riding through the battlefield, and I asked my group leader, my adult leader who was driving, if we would be going past that long row of cannon. And my um, patrol leader at that time, a boy leader, uh, just a year or two older than me, named Jody Bearden, said it's called Ruggles Battery. And that kind of stung a little bit. I'd been impressed with, with uh, Shiloh. You can't help but go there, even if you have no interest in the Civil War, by looking at the cannon and all the monuments. It's just very impressive. So I found it impressive, but I really hadn't delved into the story that much. That stung a little bit. And uh, shortly afterwards, I started preparing index cards of the various generals from looking in the World Book Encyclopedia. And I started ordering the... Uh, a little historical handbook series booklets that sold for like 35 cents. Um, when uh, Wiley Sword's book came out on Shiloh in the early 70s, I read that. And uh, then you commented about uh, when we met in 95. I don't know if you remember that in 96, uh, my wife and I had our honeymoon on one of your experiences at Shiloh, we met on an Ed Barr's tour. She's very interested in the Civil War. And you had Ed conduct a tour at Gettysburg. Wiley Sword was on the program too. So he signed uh, my book while there. So that was a thrill. Um, but uh, so that's how uh, I got interested in Shiloh and how it uh, impacted me um, getting really, uh, really into this, uh, this topic of the Civil War. You know, I'm wondering because, again, I, when, you, when you immerse yourself into something for so long, 36 years uh, in the Fredericksburg, uh, Spotsylvania area with all the things that are there, and I've seen some of the work that you've done with, um, uh, uh, with the uh, old Blue and Gray magazine and, and the, the different uh, special episodes you did there. What, what in the world inspired you to write a book and a tour guide about, uh, about Shiloh? What, what was it that drove you to do that? All right, Karen, would you put the next slide, please? Um, but um, the, uh, the booklet was done through the Emerging Civil War series and the Emerging Civil War group was formed by three either employees of mine or former employees of mine, depending on what their status was at the moment. 
And that includes uh, Chris Mikowski and Chris White. So the people that started this um, series had all worked at Fredericksburg and Chancellorsville and Wilderness and Spotsylvania. And so they knew that well, and they were the ones that wrote the books on those particular topics. Um, and just about everybody that's ever worked for me and gone through training with me has heard my story, including how I got hooked by visiting Shiloh. And so when it came time for them to think about an author for the Shiloh one, they turned to me and uh, kind of said, you know, I've, uh, I've offered uh, so many opportunities to them. They thought they had a chance to offer an opportunity to me that I might like. So I, number one, very much um, appreciated the compliment and the gesture of returning a favor. And I was also very excited about the chance to write a, a book about what is my, uh, my favorite spot on earth. So that's how that came about. Well, you know, what's really fascinating to me, I, I of course, read the book, and uh, the thing I was struck by was that it, it really is, uh, it's a combination of exceptional insights into elements of the, of the Battle of Shiloh that we're going to talk about a little bit later in, in our conversation, but uh, what fascinated me was the fact that, um, that you really more or less wrote the book and walked us through a tour of Shiloh at that time. So, so the book's organization basically takes you around to study the battle and at the different um, uh, key points that you would want to go at. And while that's not necessarily a unique uh, approach towards writing a book about a battle in a battlefield, the fact that it is so prominent within your um within your, your uh, outline and your presentation uh, made me wonder, uh, you're gonna be doing a tour for Blue and Gray and uh, we're planning to do it the first week of April, which I understand will be your very first tour as a civilian. You'll be retiring um, a few days before that after all these years with Park Service. And so this is gonna be your first civilian tour. Um, so I'm really excited about that. But in looking through the book, um, are you going to, is, is, is the book a, a great outline of how you intend to conduct this tour or are you um, gonna cut across functional lines and basically um, um, uh, uh, perhaps uh, go and, and present the battlefield a little differently? And uh, as you do that, could you maybe move just a little closer to your mic? Uh, I've got a comment from some folks that, um, that they're not hearing you really, really well. Okay. Oh, well, how is this? I may even try to, to speak louder. I, uh, but yeah, if, uh, do let me know if this and trying maybe to increase volume a little bit helps. And uh, Karen, could you give us the, the next slide, please? I, I did think, uh, well, the, the short answer is it is going to be different than the, the tour as outlined in the book. And I thought, I knew at some point I needed to give at least an overview of, of Shiloh. And this is, I think, maybe the the best point to try to explain how the, uh, the campaign and battle kind of unfolded. And then my uh, approach both in the book and my approach for the, the upcoming field trip. But um, here's a, a map predominantly of uh, Western Tennessee. And if you look in the upper middle portion, you can see a couple of star-like things showing Forts Henry and Donaldson, which fell in February of 1862 to Ulysses S. Grant. And that gave the Union Army an opportunity to move uh, um, south on the Tennessee River um, in the area where you can see C.F. Smith and Grant down to, it might be tough to spot, but there's another star near your bottom middle near what is called Pittsburgh Landing on the Tennessee River. And the reason the Union Army is interested in stopping there is because they are aware that just 20 miles in northern Mississippi, where you can see all those other arrows uh, coming to a point, the Confederates are concentrating an army at that point. The Union Army plan is to have Grant wait at Pittsburgh Landing until a second Union Army under 
Don Carlos Buell, and he's kind of visible in the upper right-hand portion. We'll be moving through Nashville and over to Pittsburgh Landing. And once there, then both of those armies will move on Corinth. Grant is under standing orders from Henry Halleck not to move, not to bring on an engagement until both of those armies um, merge. So Karen, if I could have the next slide, please. Uh, the, the Corinth, the road between Pittsburgh Landing and Corinth passes through the battlefield. On this map near the upper right, you can see a label on the river for Pittsburgh Landing. And in the lower left, what might be difficult to see is to Corinth. So there's a the road between Pittsburgh Landing and Corinth passes pretty much diagonally through this particular map. Now, the Union camps are those kind of dark blob-like features that you see with names in them, like Sherman, Prentice, McClernand, Hurlbut, and Wallace. That's where the Union Army is camped. And the Confederate plan is to attack Grant's army before Buell arrives. And the Confederates did receive intelligence that um, Buell was approaching and the timing was, was getting close. And Albert Sidney Johnson, the Confederate Army commander, his overall plan is to uh, strike hard with his right. You notice there are three arrows coming from the Confederates in the lower left. That right portion has a big sweeping movement to try to drive in the Union right flank, cut off from Pittsburgh Landing, there you are, and then drive them into the swampy area of Owl Creek. Excellent, thanks for pointing that out, that's great. Um, so that's the Confederate plan, and I'll stress plan. Um, I've also kind of listed their bullets of how it battle is actually fought. So there are really three Union positions. One is on the outskirts where you see Prentice and Sherman. That's the first Union position. The second one is going to be generally where you see Hurlbut, and that includes the famous Hornet's Nest position. And then there's a third position. Uh, where you see W.H.L. Wallace's uh, command near the top, and that is along Grant's last line. The Union position held there right above Pittsburgh Landing. Um, it was kind of close, but the Union Army held on to the landing, and in part because of that, um, Buell's army was able to reinforce on the night of the first day of the battle, first day being April 6th. Second day of the battle, April 7th, basically it is Buell and Grant launching a counterattack, regaining all of the former uh, Union camps. So that's the battle in a nutshell. And um, when I wrote the book, I really had to, felt I had to start the tour at Pittsburgh Landing where the Park Service has its visitor center. And what the book basically does is try to deal with the western half of the battle in chronological order, going basically through the whole battle. And then I switch over to the east, and I feel that the readers hopefully understand the battle by then. And then I discuss things on the first and second day kind of as they come up. So we're going back and forth in the book. So when we go on the field, um, I don't think we have to do that. I have to, in the book, try to give a simple tour that's easy to follow. But on the field, my intent is to spend one day covering the first day of the battlefield on the western part of the park, spend day two covering the eastern part of the battlefield on the first day, and then day three covering the second day of the battle. Um, I also, Karen, if you give me the next slide, uh, I also feel that when you go on the battlefield, one of the advantages to a guided tour is we can deal a whole lot more with the terrain features. That's kind of hard to do in a book. And you might have pictures, but you really can't see it. Um, I don't know if this photograph does justice, but this is Dill Branch, one of the very interesting, important terrain features of the battle. So uh, that's another way 
or where in which I think the uh, the tour is going to be uh, different on the field than in the book. You've kind of anticipated my next question um, in in running this. I've been on Shiloh a number of times over the years, and um, uh, uh, with a lot of different people who have different interpretations of the battlefield and what they think is important and so forth. Um, will you be doing what you have done traditionally in your Eastern tours? Or are you going to um, do a lot of walking or, or is most of your um, interpretation, because it's such a big field, will most of your interpretation be uh, driving to different points and talking at those points? Or are you likely to uh, spend time walking a long distance or walking some distance from point A to B and, you know, having the people drop your group off at one spot and then pick you up at another spot. Is that, is that kind of the way you're looking to do this? I don't see it predominantly as a hiking tour. It is a large battlefield. Um, there, uh, if you do have two vans and there's a great opportunity to, to drop people off at one end and have another vehicle at the other for easier shuttles, I do intend for the first and second day to each have a, a walk of uh, about a mile or so, um, one way-ish that could be a little longer if we have to go back. I could also design some of them to be shorter sections to go at different ends. But um, in a nutshell, I would think the longest I would want to be away from a vehicle, either the first or second day, might be two hours. Okay. And I do, I do like to walk, but this is not going to be a, a, a strenuous uh, trek. <laughs> and that's an important thing for a lot of people uh, who want to know that, especially at Shiloh, which is a very a rural battlefield. It's got a lot of cement for the cars to drive back and forth. But really, once you start moving with the armies, you find yourself cutting across the roads quite a bit. And you're going through a lot of um, uh, relatively uh, rural terrain and uh, um, uh, vegetation that uh, because of the time, as a matter of fact, we, if, if this goes as planned, we'll be doing it at the uh, at the very time the battle took place back in 1862. So the vegetation would be in a similar state of, um, of development for the spring. Um, I, when I was uh, thinking about this and, and what you would do is differently, I was wondering, uh, I noticed in your book, I saw a lot of the pictures were taken by you or Diane uh, and so forth, which, which told me that you all really scratched and sniffed a lot on the battlefield. Um, what, um, what did you think in studying the campaign? What were your biggest aha moments uh, about Shiloh? What, what were things that really just shocked you that, um, uh, that perhaps most people don't fully understand or appreciate? Right, Karen, go to the next slide, please. Um, um, I don't know if I interpreted this question the way you intended it, but uh, I'd like to share a few things uh, that occurred that really caused me to challenge or question how I had originally learned about this, this battle. Uh, this is a view right here of the sunken road. Um, the sunken road is just to the left of that fence. Exactly, right there is the sunken road. And um, um, I, after visiting there again many years as a scout, when I worked at Gettysburg, I had a um, roommate that was a professional photographer and I kind of got a nice camera and got into the hobby for a while. So one time I went to Shiloh specifically with the goal of trying to take some, some pictures of uh, various landmarks. And one of them was to get a view of a nice deep sunken portion of the sunken road. And I started here and I walked down and I walked the entire length of the sunken road and I never saw a sunken feature. And that, 
I just was really puzzled by that. And later on, on that same trip, Karen, if you'd like to go to the next slide, I went to the place where Albert Sidney Johnston, the Army commander uh, for the Confederacy, fell at 2.30 in the afternoon on the first day of the battle. And while I didn't have an idea as I walked the sunken road as to where a particular stretch was that I was looking for, but here I was positive that if I stood at this monument where I did as a kid, I could see a tree trunk protected by a big iron fence to protect uh, the tree under which Albert Sidney Johnston was when some of the staff found him reeling in his saddle. And I got there and it wasn't within sight of that monument. And I was really, really puzzled because I, I knew it had to be somewhere inside of that monument. And it would have actually stood a little bit to the right of this as you look. Well, I'm not sure how much time passed after that confusing visit, but eventually picked up a book called Confederates in the Attic. And that's a book I would um, highly recommend uh, anyone to read. It takes a look at our memory of the Civil War. And there's a chapter in there on the Battle of Shiloh in which um, Shiloh National Park Service historian Stacy Allen is interviewed. And by the way, I greatly appreciate his help and that of Tim Smith in uh, giving me some, some important pointers in the, in the book that I did. But um, Stacy explained first in regard to the sunken road that at the time of the battle, if you look at the accounts of the sunken road, um, they basically explain that there are a pair of six inch deep ruts and that in the intervening time between the battle and when the veterans came back after it was made a park and they looked to select where they wanted to put their monuments, that road had become very used and very rutted and washed out and very deep. And so um, they, you know, they were the only there for a matter of a few hours in the battle and they had more important things to be paying attention to than what the condition of the road was. So all of a sudden as they came back, it just kind of became somehow adopted that, oh, we were standing in the protection of this eroded roadbed, even though it, it wasn't. So in the intervening time since when I visited there as a scout and uh, visiting there with my, my camera equipment, that area had been restored and the big deep ruts that I seem to remember and uh, now had a little comfort that I accurately remembered that were gone, that the sunken road really didn't appear that way. When it came to the, uh, the tree that was by the Johnston Monument, when Isham Harris, who had been the governor of Tennessee during the battle, came to Mark where he found Johnston reeling in the saddle, they put a little sign on a tree that um, wasn't all that big. Um, it, if it was around during the time of the battle, it was a sapling, but he never claimed that this was the tree that Johnson was under. He just, they just attached it, the sign to a small tree um, next to where Johnston fell. And somehow over the years, it became the tree. Um, so I learned again from Confederates in the Attic and Stacy Allen that that was taken down and apparently is preserved somewhere inside. Um, but uh, it's interesting how some of these interpretations have changed over the years. And um, I guess the last point to, uh, to discuss under this is how my thoughts of Albert Sidney Johnston uh, have changed over the years. Um, Karen, if you'd like to go to the next slide, um, my first impressions of, of Albert Sidney Johnston, you know, I've, you know, I've heard as many of you probably have that he was the, he had the best record of any soldier to join the South. Um, and if you'd like to go to the next slide, please. Um, Albert Sidney Johnston, uh, my understanding of him mainly came from the Confederate monument. You can see the monument in the lower right and on the left, 
these three statues of women are what are called defeated victory. Interestingly, two words that don't tend to go together well, defeat and victory. A middle person uh, woman represents the Confederacy. She's holding in her right hand a laurel, a laurel of victory that the Confederates have almost won on the first day, again, according to this interpretation of the battle, but she is surrendering it to a hooded woman representing death, and there is another woman behind her representing night. Death taking Albert Sidney Johnston away from the army at a critical time, and night bringing reinforcements. Next, please. Now, this is monument is an indirect, I guess you would say, criticism of the man that took over when Johnston fell, um, G.T. Beauregard, um, because, um, go to the next slide, please. At the time that Johnston fell, the um, Union Army had uh, taken the outer camps. The Union Army had uh, launched an attack that was to collapse the second line the hornet's nest line. And now all that was supposedly left was this army that had been driven back throughout the day, this ragged army behind Grant's, along Grant's last line. And all they needed was the orders to launch an attack against that and victory was assured. And so this figure in the Confederate monument to the right looking down is meant to be a dejected officer He's dejected because he does not have the chance to launch that final attack. And the monument would have you believe that the Confederates lost the Battle of Shiloh because Johnston was killed uh, before he could complete his plan. Uh, Beauregard called off the uh, final attack because he felt that the victory was basically completed and that he would be able to uh, complete the victory the very next day. Now, next slide, please. Um, so my, kind of my next um, aspect of learning about, about Johnston, this man who, again, my initial reaction was he is exceedingly important, was to read some of the articles in Battles and Leaders. I got that as a Christmas present when I was 16. And I would read in there uh, Beauregard's account of the battle in which it's a little bit overstatement, but basically Beauregard indicates that everything that was done well was basically his suggestion and the things that didn't go well were things that he had counseled against otherwise. And um, uh, so that again led me to believe that again, maybe Johnston is not quite the general that I thought he was. Many uh, historians are critical of a point that I will get to here in a, a moment represented by this scene. But on the night before the battle, there is a gathering, a council of war. It's not near the peach orchard as this happens to say, but on the night before the battle, um, Bragg, who is in charge of the largest Confederate Corps and Beauregard, who is a second command, both felt that the uh, Confederate Army had been in close contact with the Union Army for too long and they were too noisy and certainly the Union Army must be aware of their presence and Beauregard said if we attack tomorrow we're going to find the Union Army entrenched up to their eyes and Johnston uh, decided that the attack would go on the next day. The morning of the battle there's apparently a Similar opposition that is voiced, but uh, as the uh, before the uh, discussion gets too far, the sounds of the opening gunfires are heard, and Johnston proclaimed, "Well, it's too late to change our dispositions now." And then he decided to uh, go to the front, telling Beauregard he should stay behind and direct reinforcements into the battle. Now, again, many historians are critical of Johnston, saying, "Look, he abdicated." command of the army. And he ended up taking on this role kind of as a brigadier general or a colonel throughout the rest of the day. And so I read that particular criticism about Johnson as well. Um, next slide, please. 
But as I look at what Johnston did in this in this battle, and here's this map of the plan that we talked uh, mentioned b- uh, before, the key aspect of this plan in turning the Union left is for Bragg on the right to turn the flank. Bragg has the most important role, and Johnston would explain his plan very briefly in a telegram to Davis explaining that the lineup of the troops was going to be the three main corps, one behind the other, Bragg, the the largest corps, and the man he had the most confidence in, Hardee, who, of course, wrote the tactical manual that everybody's using. He's highly thought of. Hoke, a West Pointer who has very little military experience because he went into the ministry. Breckenridge in reserve in the back, he's a politician. So, the most difficult assignments on the right to the left, progressively going down and the simplest assignment to the politician in reserve. That's what Johnston wanted. Can I have the next slide please to show just how Beauregard lined up the troops. As you go to the lower left hand again, you don't sign, find three corps side by side. You find one core Hardy in the front, Bragg's in the second, Polk and Breckenridge stacked up in back to, again, basically be reserved to go in where needed. Now, this is a horrible way to go into battle. And as you look deeper into the map, one of the things that you will notice, it shows Hardy on the left. Then you find Polk to his right, Bragg further to the right. That is not those particular corps moving in that direction. All three of those corps got intermingled and the corps commanders among themselves said, let's just go to a different sector and give orders to whoever we happen to find there. Command and control is broken down. And I argue that if um, uh, someone was to be an army commander under this situation, you're not gonna have much direction of anything So Johnston, where you see Breckenridge off to the right, that is the sector where Johnston went to. In my opinion, if you have key subordinates that are not in favor of making the attack, if you need somebody who understands and supports this attack on the right, directing the critical movement, you're dealing with green troops. Well, this was probably not a factor, but I find that Johnston does a wonderful job of rallying green troops that have broken, getting them out of the camps when they loot, inspiring green troops that don't want to don't attack when they're given orders. Uh, Johnston is on the right to make important decisions. I argue, while I, again, I have uh, heard things from the historians criticizing uh, Johnston, I have seen Beauregard criticize Johnston. I think he is at the right place, and I don't know of a general in in either army that has done a finer job um, in the battle than he has. So that's one of my other kind of aha things that this, that uh, uh, this Johnston who I, uh, after my initial impression of him from the Confederate monument, learned more about, saw a lot of criticism of him. Uh, he is uh, someone that I still think um, uh, very highly of, even though for completely different reasons than what the Confederate monument would have had me believe. But as I look at what he did, I'm very impressed that he did exactly what his army needed. You know, it surprises me and, and uh, something that I, uh, you know, I knew was going to be a situation for us is that the time would really race by on us. And, and I would like uh, us to get into a into a a place where we can uh, take some questions and so forth. Um, So I'm not gonna get through all the questions that I wanted to ask you, but um, what I'd like to do at this point, I'm gonna ask you a transition question. And for those of you who may have some questions for Greg, this would be a good time for you to uh, input them through the chat. And I'll look at them while Greg is answering this this transition question and um, uh, I think we're going to go about another 20, maybe 25 minutes max, Greg, and then we'll, uh, uh, we'll, we'll call it a night. But um, 
in in looking at at the battle as as you have in in depth for so long um what do you think was the greatest missed opportunity on either side in the battle okay um let's see so karen if you can this is going to be tough to try to explain um can you go to, I don't know what number it is, but go to Grant's last line. Um, and I'll go ahead and try to start to answer that to see if you can find that slide. Um, what I think is the, the greatest missed opportunity is while Beauregard is again criticized in the Confederate monument for not attacking uh, the last line, um, most in, in his his reason of uh, believing that the victory is already won is not a a valid reason as we we know. Thank you, right there. Um, this is a uh, Grant's last line where the battle would have ended. You can see the the Union line in the dark uh, black with Sherman, uh, McClellan, and Hurlbut, and then you can see the uh, the Confederates. Um, further down there on the other side of Dill Branch. Dill Branch is a very substantial um, terrain feature. Very difficult to get across, whether you are Confederates trying to attack across it against Grant's last line coming from the bottom to the top, or as Grant would decide at the end of the first day of the battle, he is not going to retreat, but he's going to attack the next day. If Hurlbut and McClernand are going to move forward to the south and try to get across Dill Branch, that is going to be incredibly difficult. One of the other um, things that one has to be concerned about with their army, um, everybody looks at flanks, but another thing is to try to avoid salience. Well, if you notice, there's a salient right in the middle of that line where McLernan and Sherman uh, hit. Um, so the greatest, what I think, missed opportunity is that when, um, when the battle ended on the first day, Beauregard decided to pull his men all back out of concern uh, from the gunfire of the uh, gunboats, Tyler and Lexington on the Tennessee River. You can see them just above the uh, label of Grant's last line in the lower right-hand corner. Um, I am not sure how, uh, I think their main uh, damage was being annoying to the Confederates and showing that the Union Army still had some fight in them by firing cannon. Those The two gunboats would take turns half the night firing guns into the Confederate lines, but if Beauregard could have held some of the advance lines, held Dill Branch to make moving south difficult, um, concentrated some artillery where the, uh, the Corinth Road comes out and passes beyond Dill Branch, and yes, exactly right, right through, well, it's actually the corn. yeah, that's the, <laughs> that's the Tilden Branch, but at any rate, um, there's that salient, you could get artillery fire that could potentially um, fire down McClernand's line from the west. You could maybe put some artillery next to Anderson, firing down Sherman's line to the north. Um, the Confederates had some opportunities to utilize terrain and uh, utilize the fact that the Union Army is in a salient to make it difficult or the Union attack on the next day. That is what I would have to um, stay in my opinion is the, the greatest uh, lost opportunity, punishing the, the opportunity to punish the Union Army to a greater extent on the day of May 7th. Um, you've, you've had uh, the opportunity to study leadership both East and West. Um, um, what, what do you see when you look at, um, at uh, U.S. Grant uh, at Shiloh and what you've uh, seen with 36 years of Grant out in, um, 
uh, the Fredericksburg area. What 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 are the biggest uh, changes, and uh, where do you think he's improved, and or what are his faults? I interestingly see him very consistent. Um, I see some similarities between what he did at Shiloh and what he did at the Wilderness, for example. I even see some, some I think, some interesting comparisons in his experiences. He has, for example, difficulties with Halleck, both before and after the Battle of Shiloh. He has some difficulties with Halleck before the, the Battle of the Wilderness, and yet he seems to be able to... Uh, effectively deal with that strange, difficult personality who uh, uh, has no good ideas of his own, but is excellent at criticizing other people's ideas. Um, I, um, I see that he at times has difficulty um, with intelligence information coming to him, yet doesn't let that bother him. Sherman and Prentice on the outskirts had ample evidence that there were Confederates uh, forming up out in their front, but neither of them actually um, heeded it much. And when you go to Wilderness, uh, Grant brought in Sheridan as his cavalry commander um, and Wilson as another, uh, as a division commander. And those men let him down in the Wilderness, leaving a road unguarded. Then on the first day, all of a sudden, there are Confederates now it wasn't an all of a sudden Confederate attack. It was seeing them on the opposite side of the field digging in. But still, um, I think in both battles, he adapted well to finding that Confederates are suddenly upon his front. And what I see consistently in both is that he feels that initiative is important. Even as he's forming Grant's last line that you're looking at, he realizes there's, there's comments that if Beauregard attacks first the next day, or the he doesn't, probably doesn't know that, that Johnston is down, but if the Confederates attack first on the second day, he's fearful that he's in trouble. He wants to uh, seize the initiative. And it's the same way in the wilderness, that seizing initiative, making the enemy react to you has always been an important part of, of what Grant wanted to do. So that's that's kind of how I look at Grant and the, these the, the the battles that I'm most familiar with him in in Wilderness, Spotsylvania, and Shiloh. When um, you, you when you reflect on uh, on Shiloh and the the work that you did, because uh, obviously you have a number of years of uh, of thinking and planning to to do this. Um, what could you give us maybe? Uh, two or three insights that only an insider who has really studied Shiloh carefully uh, knows and, but that everybody ought to know about Shiloh. Um, can I have the next slide, Karen? I think that's, I think I know where I'm at. Okay, I, I wanted to share some particular points of view about the significance of the battle. Um, one, and kind of the way I conclude in the book, is with something from Grant's memoirs, in which he said that up to the Battle of Shiloh, I as well as thousands of other citizens believe that the rebellion against the government would collapse suddenly and soon if a decisive victory could be gained over any of its armies. But afterward, and he means after Shiloh, I gave up all idea of saving the Union except by complete conquest. Now, Brooks Simpson, I, I happened to see a session that uh, Gettysburg College's Civil War Institute did on Grant's memoirs, and Brooks Simpson, who knows Grant well, said that, well, he really didn't give up the idea that a decisive victory could end the war. He sort of cited some, uh, some of Grant's uh, writings around uh, Chattanooga um, I think it's one thing to, uh, to I, I really don't, don't question that he, he really at that time thought of, uh, that it would be an all-out war and you'd really have to have a, uh, a complete defeat of, of one side or the other for the war to come to an end. 
um, but still try to gain that complete battle. It's kind of like I kind of use the analogy of having a dream of being a professional baseball player. It may not be realistic, but uh, you still might give it a try. Um, so while it might not be realistic to, for one, uh, one uh, complete victory to end the war, it's still worth trying to do that. Um, so I find this to be an interesting observation. And then in case you're wondering, is this just something the you know, officer would say or somebody that knows the, the situation? But if I could have the next one, Karen, I found very interesting shortly after the battle, this soldier of the 14th Wisconsin said, well, we shall destroy their army organizations, but we shall not capture them. And the war will become a fierce guerrilla warfare that can only be ended by the total annihilation of one party or the other. An interesting observation, of course, did not become a guerrilla war, but he is left with this feeling that, oh my gosh, the intensity of this fight, we're all in this wholeheartedly. It's not going to end until one is annihilated or the other. Um, an interesting observation after what is, again, the bloodiest day in American history at that point, or the bloodiest battle in American history, a battle with more casualties than uh, the casualties in all other wars prior to the Civil War. Um, and then the, the next uh, quote, Karen, um, one of the books that I find very interesting is not a book which goes through the battle step by step, but it kind of goes through the observations of the raw soldiers that fought at, at Shiloh um, um, and goes through it kind of topic by topic. And of course, well, maybe it is not, of course, but Shiloh is a battle with the largest number of green troops in it than any other Civil War battlefield. Virtually all the Confederates and, um, uh, and about half of the Union Army, I guess you should say, are, are involved in their, their first real battle. So this, this particular book um, makes an observation. I, I see my quotes are a little bit off, but th this is a quote from the authors when he said, again, comparing the letters that were written before the battle and those that are written after the battle. He says, after the battle, the proportion expressing hatred toward the enemy increased fivefold. So there's a little bit of animosity before this battle, but after these green troops go through this two days of absolute horror, the worst fighting that this nation had ever seen up to this point, um, they go out of this with an intense hatred of the enemy. And this, the quote here is from the same young man that I had on the prior screen, but he said, there is a most vindictive hatred existing between the two armies of the West, which cannot be extinguished for generations to come. And uh, boy, if he only knew how close he was to some of the, the strong feelings that would, would last generations. So those are some of the things um, when I got that question from you that I thought um, would be the best way to answer it. Let me, let me uh, I want to finish on two questions. And um, uh, the first one, uh, you know, I've got a, a Civil War library here at the uh, headquarters of some 5,000 volumes, and I've probably got a, a whole handful of um, books on Shiloh and Corinth and so forth. Um, in, your, in your many years of experience and your consideration of it, um, um, what, is, what is your essential literature review of... Um, of the uh, battles uh, around Corinth and uh, Shiloh, what what are the uh, the must read books uh, other than yours, of course? Um, well, the um, what will be the definitive source for a long time, Tim Smith's Conquer or Perish, and I think you have him coming up soon for his next week. Person's raid, correct? Yeah, next week. Yeah, this is a wonderful book. And again, I, I thank him for his preface uh, for mine and his uh, reading through the manuscript and pointing out a couple of things that greatly improved it. Um, 
another book that he was involved in as being the editor for years, everybody um, who worked at Shiloh said, well, the best book on the battle hasn't been published. It's this manuscript sitting around. It's called Shiloh and the Western Campaign of 1862. Um, not only is this a good book overall, but I like how the editors make their comments about well, we don't, we don't think that uh, Mr. Cunningham really got this right because of so-and-so. He obviously didn't have a chance to see this document. or uh, But to have Tim Smith and Gary Joyner give their comments on the manuscript, their footnotes, do not overlook the footnotes when you, uh, if you read this book. Um, the... One that is the original, and we're all indebted to the, the fact that Wiley Sword wrote his Bloody April. You chose the title of the tour to be Bloody April itself. This is the first of the really substantial uh, books on it. So this is my autographed copy from uh, Wiley Sword. And um, the other book that I really like is Larry Daniels' book on Shiloh called Shiloh, the Battle that Changed the Civil War. I am very spatial. Um, when I read a book on a battle, I often have a map photocopied right beside me so I don't have to go back and forth uh, to the maps to figure out what's going on. This book is set up kind of geographically um, he gives a landmark uh, for each heading. So I know, ex my mind knows exactly where I am on the field as I read this, this particular section. So um, for someone with my mind, the way in which he organized the book was very, very helpful to me. And if you're a spatial person as well, um, I highly recommend that. Um, last thing I referred to Stacy Allen before, his Blue and Gray magazine, even though it's a, a magazine per se and not a book, um, he's got, uh, he has some wonderful insight on this battle and uh, you will, you'll find some interesting points of view in here that you won't find anywhere else. That's great. Um, I, I would like to just uh, close this uh, first by, by thanking you very much for uh, for being the first guinea pig, Greg, it's it's always hard to be the first, and and when you throw a, a bunch of um, trip stones in front of people and stuff, um, uh, to just getting out of the gate, uh, it certainly was a challenge to uh, to get us to uh, to get this rolling. And for all of you folks who are um, uh, have hung in there with us uh, on this, I appreciate it very much. I know as soon as I get off our conversation, I've got to send out an email. To the other 60 people who wondered what the heck they missed and where where everybody was but uh in wrapping this up um i would like to uh just ask you uh, a personal question we've we've spent so long uh with this and and uh we've practically grown up together greg i mean there are, there are personal things we know about each other your sister and things that you've done and so forth that that i i just have so much respect for you now that you're on the precipice of, um, of retiring from the Park Service, what's next for Greg Mertz other than leading us a tour? What, what, are you gonna stay in uh, the Spotsylvania area or are you guys gonna move? And, and what do you wanna do now that you're gonna be retired? Well, we are gonna stay in the, uh, the Spotsylvania area. Um, the things that would be of, of interest, I'm sure <laughs> um, that I'll be doing, I, uh, I have, uh, um, um, well, back one of the things that I um, had done in the past before I became a supervisor and got really busy, I was a vice president for the, the Brandy Station Foundation and the Civil uh, American Battlefield Trust has, has asked me if I'd be interested in doing something out in the, the Brandy Station, Cedar Mountain area, um, Piedmont Environmental Council is another organization they mentioned. Uh, so as I get closer to retirement, I'll take a closer look at what, uh, but they wanted my ideas of, uh, of something out there. And uh, so that's one of the areas that I'll probably be getting a little bit involved in, although I don't know exactly what. Um, 
maybe even write more. Um, I did enjoy writing the Shiloh book. It's really my first um, book length thing. And we'll see if the emerging civil war has another topic they might like for me to, to delve into. Um, so those kind of things, maybe working a little bit in preservation, a little bit more writing. Well, I, I'll, I'll say this on behalf of, um, of the Blue and Gray Education Society and the people who are on this program. Uh, you are, you, you've been a man who has always focused on the mission. You have been rock solid every time I've, I've asked you over 20, 26 years now, uh, from the very first time we worked back in the Overland campaign, uh, uh, all the way until the very first project that we'll do after you retire from the Park Service. Uh, and every bit of it has been just an absolute joy. And uh, uh, I am just in deep admiration of you, Greg. I think I think the world of you as a historian, and even more, I think of you as, as a really fine man, knowing what I know about you and what you've done. And and I, pr I pray that um, that you know nothing but uh, warm wind under your sails and uh, and that you have a great time and that we uh, we have a wonderful time in uh, Shiloh in April. So for all of you who joined us tonight, uh, Karen, thank you all so much. And um, uh, next next program, I will send out an announcement to sign up and uh, hopefully we'll not have to do a uh, baggage carry from one to another. But. Our next program is next Wednesday. It's going to be Grierson's Raid, and the historian is going to be the aforementioned uh, Tim Smith from the University of Tennessee Martin. Thanks a lot, y'all, and good night.